No, you're welcome, Max. So the uh, subject of an upcoming Lake Gale on TG Cahar is with us now. Limerick hurling in the 1990s, I think it's fair to say, was a roller coaster ride. Two All Ireland final defeats, but lots of highs along the way, lots of great days along the way as well. And when we talk about Limerick hurling, and in particular the position of goalkeeper, then invariably we're talking about the Quaid family, who are extraordinary. And to that end, Joe Quaid, two times an All Star, is with us. And the Lake Regale, Joe Quaid, goes out half past nine, Thursday, 3rd of February. So half past nine, Thursday, 3rd of February is where you'll get the Joe Quaid. Lake Ruka. Joe, great to have you on. Thanks a million, Joe. Pleasure to be on. So I tell you what, jumped out to me. So I've seen the piece in advance. TG Carr were good enough to send it on to me. I knew about the Quaid family and often, even these days, if Nicky makes a save, it's reference, geez, you know, the Quaid family and Limerick Curling. But I hadn't fully appreciated uh, the dynasty, really, that we're talking about here. Now, you make the point at one stage in the documentary, every decade since the 1950s, there's been a Quaid in the green of Limerick. And uh, your father, Jim, and his twin brother, Jack, I suppose, get the ball rolling in a big way. Yeah, I suppose, look, uh, they were known to twins, as they were known as, uh, and they were identical twins, unfortunately. I suppose when I got the phone call first to uh, do the Laker Gwail, the both of them were alive. And since then, and before we started filming, um, both of them passed away. And I suppose that they were the oldest identical male twins in Ireland, still living, um, which was a, um, a huge, huge achievement for them, I suppose. They still looked very alike. And the, the scary part about it was that they died, Jack died first in February, and then my father died uh, four weeks later in the same hospital, in the same ward, in the same room, in the same bed. Uh, nursed by the same nurses and doctors. Um, so I suppose they took the twin thing to the to the bitter end. Um, you know, but look, they left a, a magnificent legacy. It was a pity they couldn't be interviewed by the Lake Regale people, but one thing we said was, while they couldn't be interviewed, it, it would be a lovely tribute to them. And that's kind of the way I wanted the show to go, that it would be more about... Uh, the, the dynasty of the of the Quaid family that they started off with Limerick hurling rather than I suppose if you went to my career it could probably take 10 minutes to go through and Lake Regale had an hour to fill um, I would have been extremely boring probably if it was just about that but look either them their sons or their grandsons have played for Limerick in every decade since the 50s it's it's probably something that'll never happen again and uh Hopefully, touch wood, we're not finished yet. No, I wouldn't write you off. Uh, my condolences, I hadn't actually realised it was that recent. I just I must, I didn't pick that up. Some of it was in subtitles, or it wasn't subtitles in the edition I had, so I didn't realise it was so recent. So so your father, Jim, and then his brother, Jack, your uncle, it was this year. What age were they, Joe? Uh, they were 88. Uh, Jack passed away last February. His anniversary will be coming up now shortly, and Dad passed away in 25th of March. Four weeks later um look it was tough for them for the last couple of years they had probably 86 good years um they were still active they were out and about my dad used to go into the pool in newcastle west and walk up and down it um every day and then COVID hit and while COVID, uh, they didn't die with COVID. i i'm i'm kind of convinced that COVID was the reason that uh, they seized up they lost uh, the interaction. They were great men to go uh, to go visiting. They had their routine. They'd go to bingo. They'd go visiting. They'd go places. And I suppose for the last year, year I suppose really, um, the two of them were cocooned in a house. And I remember calling for my father one day, a couple of months in, and I said, would you prefer to be safe at home or would you prefer to go out and take your chances with COVID? And he said, I'm 87. He said, I'd, I'd prefer to take my chances. But obviously he couldn't. Um, it was sad, really, when you call out to see him and you'd be leaving the house, see him sitting on the chair, watching television on his own. Do you know, it, 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 it was a sad way for them playing. But look, a lot of other families had a lot worse tragedies and things. And... I suppose it's touched on in, in the Lake of Gale. My own sister passed away with cancer almost four years ago. And Tommy, the Lord of Mercy, passed away at a very young age. So 
to be fair, the two of them, do you know what? I'll be doing well if I get the 88 as fresh as they were. Sure. But it's, it's a pity because I agree with you totally. I, and I suspect you're totally right about the effect COVID had on them. They're the undocumented victims of COVID. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, they were active men um, and been cocooned and told to stay inside um, and didn't really help them either way. And I suppose they, they sat down, they cocooned for 12 months, they died 12 months later. Yeah. So you'll be all hoping our, our last. Or last year would be a good year if your mind and your health and your body was okay, but I suppose COVID took that from them. Yeah. What's the grieving process been like for you? Because on the one hand, it's very easy to assume, well, you're of a certain age and this is just the circle of life and that's the way life goes and they, they reached a good age. And yet, geez, you're never too old to lose your father, I suspect. It's never not horrific. No, I remember the the time of his funeral, obviously, it was in the, in the midst of COVID and there were only very few people could call to the house and um, then they had to book time slots to come in and some fella came in and he said, what age was your father? And we said, 88. He said, Jesus, a good age. And we kind of said, it's not if you're 87. <laughs> it's not a great age. Um, but look, we, we were fully aware that he had lived a good life. Um, myself and my brother... Um, stayed with him the last night. We were lucky enough to be left into the hospital and stay with him the last night before he died. And Good. to be honest, he, we could see he was going. He was in a, a battle to the end. And I kind of just turned around and had my friend. I said, Dad, just fuck off. We're fine. Don't be fighting to stay any longer. Mm. And as I said, go and meet ma'am and meet my sister, Teresa. So um, I kind of made it easier, I suppose. Yeah. He, yeah. he had a good life um, and he did 86 good years. I think we'd all take that. Um, yeah. But he'd gone through his own chair. He buried his wife, my mother, 11 years ago. Um, you know, buried your daughter. Uh, he buried her three, three and a half years ago. And for Jack as well, I suppose, to have had to bury Tommy at such a young age, um, 25 years ago now at this stage nearly. Um, you know, uh, they went through their own battles, but they, they came through it and they came through it strong. And, and I'd say if you could talk to him now and ask him, ask both of them had their good life, they would have said they had. Oh, I'm sure. And were they the types of identical twins who'd finish each other's sentences and know what the other fellow was thinking? Was it that kind of a bond? Um, the, the, the strangest bond, I think, that came from them was years ago with uh, Jack's wife, Bridie, and, and my own mother, but say if there was a dinner dance or a wedding or something coming up, um, the two wives would go shopping. No, they wouldn't go shopping together. They'd go shopping individually. And the day of the dance or the wedding would come up and the two boys would be dressed the same. <laughs> so, so there must be some kind of a weird bond there. And, uh, and I suppose stories being told that it was easy to pick them out on the field because their shops were all with snow white. Um, there were two women that took huge pride in their, in their washing regime um, for whites. Um, so I suppose, look, they only lived a, a mile away from each other. Um, uh, my father was telling me there before he died that like, they lived down in Castle Lines in Cork. They were working for a man, Bat Sexton, that built schools and things. They were down there. They each had a house running water indoor toilets and Father Culhan uh, was setting up the, the hurling in Fiona and he was trying to get him back, obviously, living around uh, to play and he got the council to build him two houses. Um, so I suppose in years ago they were on about Dublin footballers and things getting houses and everything. They were probably the first so-called professional hurlers in, in the country that there was houses being built for him but they were Two council houses, identical houses, a while away from each other, were built with outdoor toilets, no running water, and I suppose it was a it was a huge thing. I asked my father, how did Mam feel like she had two young kids at the time? Um, how did she feel about moving from a house with running water and indoor plumbing, uh, coming down to a house without that? And he said, 
they just did it. They did it for the love of the game, the love of the parish, I suppose. Right. And was the was there a goalkeeper between them, between your dad and between Jack, or were they both outfield? No, they were both outfield players. My father would have mainly played in the middle of the field, and Jack would have played wing back. Um, right. Their brother Mike, my uncle, at the time of Dad's funeral, we were we were chatting about him. We'd, we'd never seen him playing, and to be fair, Mike was twenty years younger than them, and uh, we were asking what would they like and. You know, I suppose I had this picture in my head of Dad being rough and tumble in the middle of the field and Jack being the stylish wing back. And I kind of said, Jesus, no, he's a Jack who used to always come off the field clean. And we went, and why? Because he was so stylish. No, he said he was lethal. Are you in two? <laughs> and uh, the other stories about my father. And I think I kind of brought a bit of that trait when I used to play outfield myself was I really wouldn't be hauling well until I got a belt. And the story's gone around years ago that if Jim Quaid wasn't playing midfield, Aurora would win, someone hit him a belt. And often, if he was going up for a ball, one of his own players would actually hit him. Yeah. He wouldn't know that, but he'd just get the dander up in and he'd haul. Just, um, sometimes, you need, sometimes you need a whack to get involved and get into yeah. it, you know? You know so, so it, it, it was nice to hear them stories back. I'm sure, and I'm sure it's been such a, a tough time for the family. So the, the goalkeeping thing starts with the next generation then. So it's your father, Jim, and you come along. And for Jack, it's Tommy, your cousin, who does 18 years in a Limerick jersey, by the way. And we'll talk about Tommy a little bit. But So I was wondering, geez, where does the goalkeeping thing come along? And then, of course, in the Lake Regale, you, give, you gave an answer, which I understand, as the eldest of two brothers. You were the youngest, so you get chucked in goal, kid, and that's the way it is. Yeah, look, I suppose the reason I got put in goals was Tommy can take the blame for it. Um, like t- Tommy was put into goals. Like Tommy was one of the best hullers and artists of the game that I've ever seen. Right. Now, a lot of people wouldn't have seen that. That didn't see him playing club hurling. Yes, um, I see. I, I wouldn't have even. I wouldn't have even known that. And just for listeners, maybe not aware, because I know it's hard to keep track of the family. Maybe Tommy is Nikki's dad, who's. Yeah. Current, currently, obviously, in goal for uh, Limericks. And, and Tommy played 18 years in a Limerick jersey. So he was he, he could do his stuff outfield as well. Oh, Tommy. he was superb outfield. But I think when Tommy came to about 14 or 15, he was small. And he, he was probably such a good hauler. And I think back then, there was no rules for minding goalkeepers. So, um, and our outfield players, so they put him in goals. He started playing in goals when he was very young. Now, when John, Tommy's brother got to 14 or 15, Tommy moved out the field and John went into goals. So when I came to 14 or 15, John moved out the field and I was putting goals. Um, and I think the one of the first times was, I think I was 11 on an under 15 match with probably a size 37 holly up under my chin. And we had a goalie that had a tendency to pull in the ball, good shot stopper, it was pulling the ball when it was dropping and was giving away a few goals. So they were looking around the dressing room to see who they put in. And they kind of said, I should try him, try one of the quids, throw him in. Um, and I used to play out the field with the school and the club underage at that stage. So um, I think the parish priest actually after the school final one year, I thought a good game out the field. He called up to my mother and at that said match, um, a bit of a tussle developed on the sideline and myself and another lad went at it. This was national schools match. Like, and of course, I told him, I used, I used expletives. And next when I look around, there's the parish priest. Be seen cursing in front of the parish priest. It was probably one of the worst things back then you could think of doing. Um, the following day, home from school, Next minute, the parish priest pulled up, who was never called to the house, pulled up outside the door. And I said, oh, Jesus, I'm in trouble here. And then my mother called me out from the sitting room, out to the kitchen. Father Kelly has something to say to you. Yes. And I goes, yeah, well done yesterday. And he pointed to my mother and he goes, don't ever let him play in goals again. He should be playing out the field. So there was no mention of the swearing at the event. Um, but... Like, I suppose it was a natural progression then for me to go in. But like, Tommy was a huge help to me when I started playing goals first. And, and you know what? Looking back at some of the clips I've seen so far as well and, and through my career, I, I made a kind of a, a career out of blocking balls with 
anything I could possibly do out the holiday. Um, and when I started yeah. first, I used to be getting hit with balls. And the best advice Tommy gave me was keep an eye on the ball. You can see it, you can get out of the way. And then he was taking shots with his brother Pat and that below on me in their field one day. And I went, Jesus, actually get out of the way. I'm not getting hit anymore. Yeah. And then he said, no, no, you can get out of the way. You can see the ball. He said, oh, you can try and stop. Interesting. And uh, so Is I it, kind of developed from there. Yeah, and yeah. There I was playing senior. I played my first West senior hurling final when I was 15. Okay. Um, I have twin boys now of 17. They're big, strong lads. And the thoughts of them going playing senior hurling against some of the lads that I had to tug out against forward lines, um, it's scary. Yeah. Like I and I wasn't a big young fella. I was small. I was thin, you know. But I suppose okay. While the full forward lines were scary, the full back lines were quite scary as well. <laughs> so yeah. there wasn't there wasn't too many of them left in past me, uh, past them Tommy. But uh, look at it. But I. Would I change it? I, I suppose I got sick of hurling at a younger age because I was playing so much. I think one year I played under 15s, 16s, minors, 21s and seniors for the club. Um, and while it was probably great at the time, uh, looking back, it, I think when I came to 28, 29, 30, I kind of lost the love mm. for the game um, for a good few years. Um, and then... I suppose it's too late then to go back. It's now looking back. I'll be 50 now in April. I'm looking back and say, Jesus, I should have continued playing for a bit longer. Mm-hmm. See, i got to be honest with you, Joe. It's about the last position in any sport I'd go near. And I think uh, most sane people feel that way. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Tommy gave you that advice to watch the ball. And to, to watch the ball you have to put fear to one side, don't you? Because you have to really concentrate on the ball and leave yourself open to maybe not seeing the ball and getting smacked with the ball. Like, I, 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 again, I was watching some of the saves that you, you you made and like you're making saves with your ankle bone and your shin and your all sorts of your parts of your body. And look, obviously there's the horrific injury later on in your career, but, he, but even just day to day, going, going training and all sorts, getting whacked with this thing. Jeez, I just wouldn't go near it for all the tea in China. Like, I don't know, what, how did you kind of come to terms with that aspect that you're, you were going to get lots of belts? I suppose it was probably training at home. It was only when I went back home after years and saw the, the side lawn where we used to have games. Uh, the lads used to be taking penalties of me and there was a ditch probably three foot high behind me with one slitter. If the ball went over that, it went across the road and any duties field. I spent two hours digging the ditch out trying to find a setter. <laughs> I suppose you you became good out of necessity, and um, that's probably definitely a bit of madness in there somewhere. Yeah. Or something. Um, so you, do you, and do you, do you remember thinking, "Oh God, I've had enough of getting whacked here"? Obviously not. You obviously loved it. No, the only time it really affected me, and I didn't think it affected me, and I think I touched on it. The program is um, after getting the belt and getting the injury. It was. Two years after, I think, we played down in Cork. And as you said, from the tips, I stopped with every part of my body. And Paul Flynn, I think we were playing water for them. Paul Flynn came in along the in line. I ran out as I always ran out. Mm. And he threw up the ball. I jumped. But when I landed, I my arse turned him. And I saw the ball go into the back. Right. And I landed then and I just went, nah, you're done. Your nerve almost. Must have been. I didn't think it was gone, but obviously my subconscious had kicked in and that was probably the lowest point in my inter-county career. No, I wouldn't have been probably expected to save it. No, but you knew. You knew but something I knew when changed. I landed and I was facing the net. Yeah. That something wasn't right. I'm conscious that there could be younger listeners going, hang on, what are we talking about here? So and we'll come, I want to come back to your time with Limerick, the good days, because there were lots of good days as well. But um, we're talking here after All-Ireland Finals 94, 96. You you win the All-Star in 96, and then it's a game against Leash, and you get a belt in the testicles. And, I mean, you use the word in the Lake Regale, you use the word exploded is what happened to one of your testicles, which is just absolutely horrific. For a start, how they didn't take you off and how you finished the game... 
Like, and there's a bit of a story behind that, and I think probably the the guys that are speaking because I haven't seen the Laker Gale yet. I'm still waiting to see it. Um, I suppose I would have had a bit of a reputation for lying down <laughs> in that time. Um, so I kind of got the message out to the management, and it was a case that Tom Ryan kind of went, ah, he's all right. So he's always at that crack. The boy right. who cried wolf. Right. Um, right. right. But you, you, you must have known this is a pain unlike which I have not felt before. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember in the second half, I was kneeling down. No, we won the game by a massive amount, I think. I think Leach scored only something like seven or eight points the same day, if I'm correct. And I used to wear I'd bad grinds. I used to wear these neoprene cycling shorts, really. Yeah. And I remember kneeling down and pulling them to one side to leave the air in to get a bit of relief. And at one stage in the second half, a ball came in and I slid out, picked it away, and one of the Leach lads came in Pure accident. His knee met me down top of the groin again. I think I swung at him, and he said, "Jesus, what's going on?" Yeah. I said, "Lad, nothing to do with you. Just get off me. I'm in agony." And yeah. uh, as I came back, out after the match, went for a shower. And next when I showed the doctor and they're boiling, he just looked and he said, "Jesus Christ!" And I said, "What did they do?" He said, "Just go to ask." Right. And I knew then the game was up. I knew something, something serious. Something serious wrong. Um, a pair of button jeans in me they were all the rage at the time and uh, I couldn't actually close them properly the swelling the um, swelling right yeah. right right um, so but I suppose one of the funniest stories and for Sean and the promo for it I stopped in McDonald's and they went to the hospital <laughs> delayed the operation by about six hours but, well I, I I saw you say on it that you got to the hospital and the doctor comes in looks at it and says ouch <laughs> which is, you know, no kidding. And he goes off and gets another doctor for a look. The other fellow comes in and he goes, he says, is it sore? And the first doctor says, what do you do? Oh, God. Um, so but, my, what, what age are you then in 97, Joe? 20, 25. So my first thought there as a 25-year-old is, am I going to be able to have children? Am I going to lose my testicle here? Yeah. Which must have been absolutely frightening. Were they able to give you an assurance that night or was it a wait and see job? Uh, no, it was fine. The following morning, um, I suppose when I, when I came back, I think it was around 10 or 11 o'clock, I went down for the operation. And a Sunday sport was on. They were showing league matches. Now, nobody knew this was after happening to me and they were feeling me out through the, the ward and telly was on. And... Next one I says to the reporter, stop. And they showed highlights of every other match and scores. For some reason, they showed the penalty. And I said, your man, that's why you're wheeling me here now. Um, so I went up, met a, a girl from Kilmallock that was big into the Holland. I think I actually signed an autograph or two for her son uh, up in the, while I was waiting to be knocked out. And then when I woke up, I said to her, I said, well, what's the story? And she said, oh, sorry, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. And I knew then. So I came back to the ward. Doctor came down the following day and he explained it. But I knew it was only one. I suppose, look, when you're 25 years of age, um, the thoughts of kids, even at that stage, hadn't probably entered the head. Um, so it wasn't really something that, I suppose, over much of my thoughts at that time, the big thing was would I get back hurling again? Probably. Mm. Um, yeah, that, yeah. that was probably the main thought in my head. Yes. Well, thankfully, four kids on. It wasn't uh, life changing in the way it could have been. And so at, at that stage, Joe, the idea of wearing a cup or some kind of protection in hurling was a non runner across the board, was it? Was anyone doing that in that position? I don't think so. Um, no, I think everyone is wearing them now. Yeah. Um, even to get them that time. I remember I went away and I actually bought one of the boxer scarves. There were big bulky yokes that the boxers wear. Yeah. Um, and I wore that for a good few years after until I found out that ones the cricket lads wear are kind of inside in a pair of jocks and, uh, and you just dip in the cup. Um, but uh, you think of it like I went back, when I went back training one night, I think DJ Ryan came through, threw up a ball, leathered it at me, hit me straight into the cup and probably went about 20 yards out the field and 
I'm Ryan, I like could hear him on the side and I was going, oh Jesus. And I, I drove me back. And uh, he said, are you all right? And Tom was a great old character. And I just put the hand down and I went, one, yeah, and grand Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe it's a question of a, a goalkeeper's technique. Maybe like, you know, it was interesting you mentioned Tommy and watching the ball and that way you can get out of it. Maybe other goalkeepers just save it with their body at times and you were one of those. Uh, like David De Gea, to use a different sport, will save with yeah. his feet a lot. So was this accident against Leash like a real rarity or would you have been hitting the testicles like 20 different times down the years would have been just one of those no, things that you had. I got hit once when I was 12 playing outfield. Right. Um, but nothing, nothing like that. Um, okay. okay. I think what happened that day was, and I only actually saw the clip again there, uh, with the, put a promo on for the Lake of Well. It was a wet day, it was hit low. I think I missed it with the holly and it, and it skipped up. Um, like plenty of them, I suppose, hit me in the stomach and things, but yeah, it was it's, it's such a a small area to be hit there often would be slim enough. Yeah, you know, true. Because you'd always have the holly in front anyway. Um, so it was just an accident. Yeah, and I'm too young to quite remember. Did the whole country know this had happened afterwards? Was this in the papers? No, nobody knows until the following day. Oh um, yeah, but it, but but people did know like a week later. Did, yeah, I was in the in the Star newspaper the following day, sitting right. there inside in the hospital. Um, right. Okay. After it was happening. And you because so, it's like some people wouldn't want the world to know. You you'd no problem obviously talking about it even then. Oh, my mother gave out to me the following Christmas. Um, one of the, I can't remember what report was it with the Independent at the time. Um, did an interview coming up to Christmas, and uh, he said to me, he said, "This is what went through your mind when you got the belt." And I said, "Is I looked out over the back wall and came out to see what the drone gone out over it, Mason." <laughs> and of course, he fake and printed it. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was my mother said, "You can't say them things." Yeah, I think I actually ended up on the newspaper that year. They were doing quotes of the year, and I, I actually think I got quotes of the year. <laughs> well, in fairness to you, not a bad one. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it's, like, it's, it's a shocking thing. But like that's why. And uh, sorry, I, I hadn't intended to kind of lead off with it. But when you talk about that moment, then a couple of years later, where you 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 know you jump for the shot and your your arse is is kind of facing yeah. where your body should be, like. Uh, did you think about walking away? Like I, I words like post traumatic stress were not used in 1990s Ireland and all this kind of oh. stuff. Or, or can, you know, I'm sure no one said, "Do you want to go and have some counselling and just talk through it and and see if there's anything to be processed?" Because, you know, I I would say that's that's career ending. Like I'm amazed you put yourself back in front of Slitters being fired at you ever again. You know, it's amazing that you did that. Yeah. There was no such thing as sports psychologist back that time. There was no one to talk to. Um, but I knew myself. Um, was it was the edge I probably had over maybe other goalkeepers of that, in that I was headless times. Um, you know, and I knew that was gone. Um, from then on, and I probably should have walked. Uh, being realistic, I suppose you set your own standards. I'd safely say that towards the end of my career, 2000, 99, 2000, I finished then in 2000. I wasn't there for 2001. And I came back again in 2002 and I shouldn't have. And I just went away then quietly um, after that. But I knew, I knew it was gone. And it probably affected the top career as well. Um, you know, I had transferred from Fiona, my home club, over to where I'm living now, Marubor. Um, no, we won uh, County Intermediate with Marubor in '99. Um, but I suppose I'd set my own standards and I couldn't keep to them. And that kind of got frustrating. I played a couple of years as a sub and out the field with Marubor and that. And I felt a lot more comfortable there. Um, I bet. You know, and I didn't think it through at the time. 
but subconsciously I probably didn't want to play in goal. And yeah. maybe that's the reason behind it. Oh, I'd say it is like on some level, your brain is saying to yourself, there's not a, a, a chance in hell I'm risking this happening again. So I'm protecting you whether you like it or not. And that, ta- that takes over in the vital moments. Yeah, and, and that's probably what did happen. Um, I remember, was it 2000? What was the year? Yeah, about 2000, I think. Um, I think my puck out even went. It always a long puck out. And I was struggling coming up to championship to hit the halfway line. And I went back, looked at videos of myself, technique, no goalkeeping coaching, there or anything. And was, I just left a whole lot at me. Mm. And by the time I finished, I remember it was a Christy O'Connor said in, in Last Man Standing the book, um, as a shot stopper, I go down as one of the best, but to be regarded one of the greatest I had in the longevity in my career. Um, I don't know what, when I read it first and I was after giving Christy a lot of time doing the book and doing my bit for it, I kind of went, well, if you, um, but when I actually read it back again, I actually went, you know what, you were right. Yeah. You were 100% right. Well, I guess the way to look at your career is you burst onto the scene in 94, you take over from your cousin Tommy, who's done 18 years, this huge amount of pressure on you. You start off, you know, brilliantly cork that day in the rain and you know, after conceding two goals in 15 minutes, you have a brilliant game and you win an All-Star and you get to an All-Ireland final and 96, you win another All-Star and then this accident happens in 97. I mean, really what you're kind of talking about here is a, a, geez, a brilliant career, which is, was ended by injury. I know you continued on and you kept going, but like, I think you have to view 97 as a, as a line in the sand, you know? Yeah. So that's, like, that's no fault of yours. Like I played three years, I think mine are three years, 21s, was on the panel then for three years as a sub to Tommy and then came in and was realistically I had three three years at the top of my game which yeah. isn't a long time no it's good uh, to win two two all-stars and three is good you know and I suppose we won the league then in 97 um but 98 on I I felt myself I was I was a pale pale shadow of uh at 26, I should have been hitting the prime of my career. I see Nicky now, he's what, 31, 32, better he's getting. Um, you know, so I suppose I lost out in them few years. Would I blame myself? For, I don't know. No, no, you couldn't. Know. No, you couldn't. You couldn't blame yourself. Um, so some of the good stuff then, because sorry, that's, a, you know, that's, the, that's the unfortunate stuff towards the end. 94, 96, to, to reach all Ireland's and to be young and to be stepping up and realizing that you're good enough and to win all stars is amazing. And, and I, some of your saves are just brilliant. And people will see them on the Lake Regale on the 3rd of February when they watch it half past nine on TG Carr. Some just brilliant, brave, amazing saves. Your save in the All Ireland final in 96 is outrageous. I think it's Tomas Mulcahy is on commentary and he says that's one of the best saves we've seen in Crow Park in a very, very long time. It was just uh, reflexes at their best. So aside from the advice Tommy gave you, you said there's no goalkeeping coaching as such. How do you how do you figure it out? I mean, how do you devise your technique? Is it just instinct or are you watching all the brilliant goalkeepers around the country or or how are you deciding how you play the game? No, as I say, it was it was probably self-learned. Um oh, the one thing that I did, I I, I loved soccer and I loved soccer goalkeeping, but I suppose we grew up in an era where, oh no, you can't be playing soccer, foreign games and all that. And my father didn't let me play soccer. I played a few games with the school and that, but we used to play it out the back of that. And I remember getting a book from the library of Bob Wilson, um, The Act of Goalkeeping. I ended up in the library court because I didn't give it back. <laughs> got fined. Um, but I, I remember I, I always kind of had an interest from the time I stepped in goals and I was out by the wall at the house at home with a pebble dash wall, um, a harness maker slitter. If nobody has probably even heard of them now, you hit him and they come back to you like an egg. 
Um, there was rims in them. You could pick them up like a six pack. Away. So you're belting a ball off the wall. The lawn is probably, how would it be, 10, 15 feet from back to the wall. So you had to hone your, your reflexes really good there. Now, I did play a huge amount of handball um, from when I was probably 10 up. And I won an All-Ireland handball medal. I got beaten a five months of the finals in a row. Um, so we played a lot of handball, a lot of squash, which would have helped with the footwork and and that and flexibility and stuff like that. But uh, that was all right. You know, you go to the pitch, you hold, I suppose the puck outside of it, from our small lawn up to the field next door, there was a telegraph ball about 70, 80 yards up. And one slitter, you aimed, you tried to hit the pole, you went back up, you tried to land it in the lawn. If you overshot the lawn, it was in the window. And that probably happened a few times. Um, do you know, so it was it was definitely, I suppose, a lot of self-taught. I remember first time uh, I kind of heard of a goalkeeping coach, Christy O'Connor and Willie Banks, um, who was my goalkeeping coach uh, when I was in Kildare and Westmead and that. And I remember going to a session one day with Willie and he was explaining how it was done and he told me to step in and I went, ah, oh, but that's how I did it. <laughs> I just did it. I never broke down or I never went to the trouble of breaking down how it was done. Um, but... Um, and and can, can I ask, do you think a lot of the things you taught yourself to do our best practice that you were actually on the right track in most areas or are you, are you do were you doing certain things that today would be looked uh, upon as the wrong way to do it but sure it, it depends on the way the game evolves you know no day my day it was you get to ball in your hand for a puck out you know put it as far away from yourself as possible sure but i suppose i'm more something with shot stopping were you kind of doing all the right things that, no i think i was because it was all about angles. It was all about, like, as I say, Willie, I've seen him coach and goalies, he's on about stick angle, you know, and what angle you should have to stick at if a ball comes off it at a different angle or whatever. But I suppose from practicing at home, I knew if a ball came back to me and I did it at the wrong angle, the ball would be going out behind me into the field. I knew the next time to adjust. So I suppose... What the goalkeeping coaches have done is probably put a lot of put tags and, and labels on what I was doing and hadn't a clue that I was doing. Yeah, okay, good. Um, good. you know, so yeah. I I'm probably the type of fella that it's the same if I'm putting stuff together and years ago putting stuff together for the kids. I put it together first, and then I'll see if I make a balls. <laughs> Then I go and get the instructions. Instructions after. Okay, fair enough. I'm an instruction first kind of guy, but I I, I think uh, I respect the way you do it, actually. No. Um, 94 and 96, anyone who lived through the era of 1990s hurling knows how colourful it was and how amazing it was. And uh, Limerick beaten by Offaly at the death so famously in 94 and then beaten by Clare in the 95, sorry, 97. Would have been 90, uh, I'm I'm 95. 95. 95. Sorry, yeah, it was Claire's first one. So this is Lachnan and Claire. So 95, yeah. this is knockout. So that's that. 96, you come again. You beat Cork. You beat Claire on a very hot day. That's the yeah. famous Kieran Kerry point, which is so famous. And you beat Tipperary. So, geez, talk about winning Munster the hard way. And unfortunately, 96 means Wexford, uh, where you make those outstanding saves and you win your All Star. 94, 96, like, are they, do you remember them? fondly despite what happened at the end is it very mixed or do you hate even thinking about them um you can't forget about them <laughs> well that's true any, any day you'll meet someone there's always someone to remind you um and mainly about 94 christ you threw that away yeah um as i said and i actually would you believe i watched it the other night i think jimmy mcgee did the best of 94 hurling and i found it on youtube the other night and I had never watched it before. And this was a great year. It was an unbelievable year for us. Like, I was after taking over from Tommy. And as a goalkeeper, I always hated the rain. Woke up that morning, looked out, it was pissing rain. And I went, oh, no. I, this, for your your, this for your debut. My debut, like, yeah, yeah. against Cork, who 
would have been I never remember Limerick beating Cork it was probably 14 years it was 14 yeah, it years. was 14 yeah and I remember walking around in the parade Eddie Grounds it's in rain and I just look what are you doing and two goals went in in the first 15 minutes now there was nothing I could really do about any of them but there was a, a fella behind my father took off his cap never noticed my father banged left to see it yeah, for fuck sake he said bring back Tommy at the end of the game I know I was the best thing since the slice pen so I, I, you know you become you, you become carried away I suppose in a way and I remember watching it the other night in the semi-final then against Waterford after breaking my favourite Holly. And we were up five points in Waterford, got a late goal on a, I don't know which one of them caught it around 21, hit a shot, pulled her height at me. Because I wasn't comfortable with the Holly, I pulled the up and the ball went in. And that was a thing to bring you so much back down to earth again but like the crowds that were there the, the interaction with them I don't know what a winning dressing room is like for the Ireland final but I can I put any money on it there is no way it could have replicated the dressing room we had in 94 after beating it was just unbelievable there was fans everywhere in the dressing room mm. there was a sing song it was just uh, aluminium ducting up and Eric Grounds and Pat Heffernan was above and he beat that with a holly he saying the 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 talking version of the staff that chants out and the place was full <laughs> there was supporters and everything inside of us and I think the cards kicked in the door that thought it was a row <laughs> and uh, the corridor was full um, you know, I, I don't think anything could have wrecked yet no no, That's the memory I have. I've no memories of the dressing room after Munster Finals. I can't remember the dressing rooms after winning two Munster Finals, winning the league, any of that. The one dressing room, and thankfully I don't have a memory of any of the two All Ireland losing dressing rooms. Um, I don't even have a memory of the dressing room before the 94 All Ireland. I remember the 96 one because I suppose the 94 one kind of passed me. And in 96, I remember walking out just at the end of the minor match. I looked up around the ground and I said, this, I'm going to enjoy this. The last, as it turned out, it was. Um, I was probably more relaxed going into that. Um, no, I suppose I was talking to Nicky, going back there before Christmas, and he was just saying, like, I suppose the three all Islands they've won lately. They've saved their best performance each year for the All-Ireland final. And I said to him, I said, and we saved our worst performance of the two years, All-Ireland finals in both. Mm. Um, you know, we savage monster campaigns. Um, that day in Limerick, when Kieran took off up the field, 15 minutes ago, I was looking up at the stand. It was melting. I actually ended up getting sun. Um, and looking up at the stand and where am I going? Haldas. Out, you were beaten, you were out, and next minute we Barry Foley came back, start taking on a few points, and, and you kind of straighten up. So, Jesus, this this could happen. And to see Kerry going up the field with the last ball, and just to put it and the worst part about it, he turned on his weak side, and we just give him an office thinking about his weak side because he could drop the ball and miss it. Like, and if you watch that, it just looped, yes, it just barely looped over, yeah, and uh. I remember my seven year on, we were probably one of the last two to leave the field and went to dressing room. I remember going in that day and he took his boots off. He used to wear the rugby studs, three long studs so for grip. And the ground was like concrete. He took off his boots that day and there was zero skin left on the soles of his feet. The blisters, God. And no, there was no, there was no blisters. Oh. It was it was raw. The, the skin had come off. Um and I remember he walked up to us, walked up to the shower. And that day we used to have a fag after. <laughs> well, of course. I mean, yes. how, how could you not? Had, had a smoke in the dressing room after. And we smoked two fags going up the steps and he's handing my shoulder and he limped up in his heels to try and get up there. And like what that man was after doing 20 minutes earlier 
with the feet he had burnt off him um, was just, oh, it's one of the highlights uh, of, of my career anyway, just to be behind him and, and I could, I had the best view of it so I could see him going. Yeah. And we were there, go on, keep going, keep going, keep going. And next one, he punched his fucking weak side and we went, oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> and, and if you watch it back, I, I, I think it was the Shawnee McMahon was after him and probably had known that this was his good side and stayed and he kind of took a stump with the, his weak side and that threw Shawnee off the scent. Then, and he put it over the bar and oh, it, was, it was phenomenal. And just to walk up to the Woodfield House after that, that day, everyone around was in good form and it was, it was huge. Like, I don't know do the, the players these days um, enjoy it as much. Like in our day, it was our hobby. It's their lifestyle now. Yeah. We was we was go train and run crack on a Sunday day after Stevens Day. You'll be after probably a feed a pint Stevens Day. And you go up and run crack and you'll come back down then to get it grounds and make it a griller that used to feed us. With a big feed of rash or sausages and a mountain of heavily buttered toast and you know, anything we'd done run up Crack Hill was probably wasted. Yeah. Um, I, well, I, I, I think, I mean, I definitely get the impression they enjoy it, but I, God, I think the 90s was a tough time to beat. You know, it was just extraordinary and, like I said, visceral and colorful and all these characters. And it's just kind of an amazing time. Um, clock's kind of coming against us. So, I won't even get to touch on half the stuff I'd planned to like your own management career or life away from the game, but I, I guess a, a good place to finish maybe. You mentioned Tommy throughout the conversation and, and tragically he passes away in a, an accident, renovating renovating a place, uh, falls off a ladder or falls and, and hits his head and, and I don't know, life is is bizarre like that. Uh, you talk you talk brilliantly in the documentary about watching Nicky win an All-Ireland and I thought it was, it, you captured the emotion of it, but you also said you'd always wondered would you feel a bit jealous when a Limerick team yeah. got over the line after he had come close so often and because there's no way you know until the moment comes and no and uh thankfully geez jealousy was nowhere there it was you were you were as um as moved by it really as anyone could be yeah it was it was it was 45 years of torment and it was probably 20 what was it 17 20 odd years since we had been there more how was it 94 to 18, 24 years um, of, of hurt, I suppose. We were taken around. Um, and and that side of it was, I suppose, it was like someone had a tap on my ankle and left it all out. Um, it just drained all of that out. And yeah, it, look, <laughs> I always wondered if I did win one and I wasn't there, would I feel robbed? But do you know what? The fact that Nicky was in goals probably helped that. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe if they'd won one in 2002, you might have felt a bit different yeah. or something. Yeah. You know, but no. And the fact that Nicky was in goals and he's such a nice lad, um, you know, you'd just feel nothing but, oh, you'd well up. While the, the hot drained, probably someone with a pump on the other side pumping in pride, um, into 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 and to be able to be there to witness it, um, I don't think if Limerick or when they do or whatever, if they win more, um, as I said about ninety four Cork match, nothing will replace that. Likewise, nothing will replace as a supporter the atmosphere in in eighteen. No, oh, the last eight minutes were absolutely horrendous. They were worse than the five minutes in 94. <laughs> because I said, oh, Christ, again. Mm. This cannot happen again. Um, and then when Tom Conda came over with that ball, because I had looked up, I couldn't watch the free, and I picked a Limerick and a, and a Galway jersey, and none of them reacted to me being hit. And I was right on the 14-yard line, halfway up to Hogan's stand. And when I turned, the ball was just dropped. And I said, 
and Tam Kandabu. It was just unbelievable, Do you know. And I suppose that that buried it. Like I think Declan Hannan alluded to it. Like or the, them lads, some of them lads were born. born um, when it happened was ninety four, but they still felt it. <laughs> that oh, I'd say they'd seen the DVDs. It's sort you of know stage. what I mean? Yeah. It, and do you know what? The day that day when he made the speech, I thought it was absolutely beautiful the way he said. For everyone that has gone before us. Yeah, it was classy. I just thought, I felt like he was talking to me and and nobody else in the crowd. And mm. it was like a, a kind of a personal thanks. And uh, we they're such nice lads. Jesus. Uh, like, I had, I had probably eight or nine of that panel from under 14s up to under 16s. He nice. and Sean Galan, Tom Morrissey. Sean Finn, and we knew at 14 there was some indeed that. Right, interesting. Um, they were not only were they good hurlers, but they were good people. And hard enough to say that about a 14 year old. Most of them are cheeky brats. You no, know, these lads, there was just something about them. They were, they were just, they were just something special. And, I suppose they played a small part to coaching him up to 16s and to see him six years later achieve what they achieved and keep seeing them achieve it is, is just is just huge. And, you know, anytime you're out or, or out for a walk or shopping or anything, if the lads are dead, they'll always come up, they'll have a chat. Um, the same with my kids. Uh, well, my daughter works inside and Chu and the crest and Keen comes in and like everyone thinks it's a massive thing but to her she knows him so long from being involved coming training with me and that it's Keen and they talk about her going to college they don't talk about hurling and he gives her advice and she just thinks it's <laughs> whereas there's other ones in there Christ, the hurler two time hurler of the year uh, holding icon and probably one of the greatest holders I've ever seen, along with Kieran, um, is coming in and they're just he's so down to earth mm. um, and so humble. It's does massive credit due to and to John Kiley, um, and the backroom team for the way they've they've molded these lads. And yeah, I, I think they're they've brought. I mean, they've they've made them good people. Yeah, well, I, you know. The best thing you can say about them, even as they become serial winners now, is I think the whole country still really likes them. You know, which is uh, not always the case when you're when you're dominating. Oh, well, if you win another one, that'll change. Ah, yeah, we'll give out about them soon enough. Um, listen, Joe, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you. I really enjoyed the Lakewood Gale. I'd encourage everyone to keep an eye out for it. Again, it's on Thursday, the third of February at half past nine, and uh, I guess nice thing to get a Lakewood Gale as well. So nice thing for the oh, family to have. Massive yeah. honor, massive, massive honor. Um, Oh, as I say, I, when they rang me, I kind of said, you want to know about the family? And they said, no, you. And I went, well, I kind of like to steer it towards the family thing. And it was, look, the, the best thing I could hope for out of it is that it, it's a massive tribute to Jim and Jack. We started all this off. Um, and from Jim to Tommy, myself to Nikki. And uh, hopefully there's I've two young lads and then 19 squad never guess where he's playing Joe oh, go away yeah yeah. he's on the 19s with Limerick um, so we're, we're not finished yet <laughs> that's extraordinary oh. extraordinary no pressure kid the, uh, um. <laughs> no no pressure but there's obviously some form of a lunatic streak <laughs> going right down through the family well on that note Joe Quay thanks so much really appreciate the time thank you thanks Joe